Today, we're lucky to have Professor um, Geisler. He's going to talk about climate jihad in Africa, sea level rise, forced migration, and related turmoil across the continent. Professor Geisler retired from the Development Sociology Department two years ago, but continues to write about the social impacts and unforeseen consequences of climate change. For over a decade, he taught a Cornell seminar on global terrorism and the global insecurity unleashed. Today's lecture brings together the seemingly unrelated topics of war and climate change, a fusion of his interests, old and new. So let's welcome Professor Geisler. Hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> nice to be here. Um, I got to say that <clears throat> Cornell should be commended for not only uh, promoting this course, which you're able to take, but uh, for many other things that are currently going on in the so-called Cornell Climate Action Plan. A little later in the semester, you're going to have a um, really great lecture giving you the overview of exactly what's going on. But I have to tell you that over the last two decades, Cornell has just awoken. The literacy <coughs> across campus is marvelous. And you students have had a major role in influencing the kinds of things Cornell does. And they update this climate action plan every year. So last year, student input influenced the things that have been added to. It's not replaced, and some things are rotated out. Cornell is really, really serious about this, and many other colleges and universities have used the Cornell action plan as a, as a template. So, Keep your ideas coming forth, and thanks for being in this course. I'm going to uh, take you in a direction today that in many ways follows very nicely on the lecture you heard from Professor Garcia last Monday, having to do with climate refugees. But I'm going to do something a little bit different uh, with it. And it's something that I think we all need to take seriously, and that is the, the prospect that climate change is a contact sport big time. It's leading to low intensity warfare. It's scaling up already existing conflicts of many kinds, not all of which are designated as war or manifest certified violence, but nonetheless constitutes war. That's actually going to come in the second half of the lecture today. In order to get there, I feel the need to do some preparation. And um, let me just start by posing a question to you. If someone came up to you, say after class today, and said, so what's the connection between war and climate change? Think a minute. What, what would you say? For any of you who were thinking about um, the ways in which the military depends on hydrocarbons and fossil fuels, you were certainly heading in the right direction. The, the global military is the largest user of fossil fuels in the world. Actually, I could make it a little more astonishing. The United States military is the largest institutional user of fossil fuels in the world. But that's not really the direction I want to talk about today. That's sort of going from the military and the wars, the preparation, the training that they prepare for, what they contribute, to climate change because of the hydrocarbons they're using, I want to actually take it in the opposite direction. And that is, we're going to talk a lot about it today, severe climate change, wherever it comes from, is conducive to conflict, which very often escalates into long-term warfare. Here's the outline. Um, I'm going to acquaint you with some context 
Um, other people have rather eloquently and in original ways talked about this connection between global climate change and war. Um, and I'm going to focus in on one particular component. It happens to be something I've done research on, and it is uh, it sort of brackets what I can talk to you about. And that is, as sea levels rise, obviously we're going to have lots and lots of flooding. So people are going to be migrating inland, as you heard about in spades last Monday. And as they do that, there's going to be a serious crunch, a conflict between the inhabitants who already are set up to live their livelihoods in the interiors of island nations and whole continents, and you and me, who are picking up stakes and moving inland. We're not always going to find a welcome mat. In fact, sometimes there's going to be serious rebuttal. Think of the Rohingyas trying to leave Bangladesh and go next door, um, et cetera, or leaving Burma, excuse me, and going to Bangladesh. <clears throat> then I'm going to use the African case as a case study. And you might be startled because uh, many of us think, wrongly it turns out, that Africa in some ways is an empty continent. There's been that myth about Africa for generations, maybe even centuries. And it turns out not to be the case. And it turns out that Africa is extremely vulnerable to climate change, both sea level rise and interior aridity and uh, changing climate. And then some conclusions. OK, you with me? Let's go to the first one. Over the weekend, what did we hear about in the news? more warfare in Syria, did we not? It's really messy. I mean, it keeps escalating. We kind of think, can there really be more violence heaped on Syria? Well, the answer is yes. I think something approximating 300 people were killed just this past weekend, and 800 people were displaced in Syria as a consequence of these various movements and alliances that are going on. And it turns out that the Syrian debacle, which started back in the um, basically 2007, 2008, do you remember what caused it? Some of you know this, I know. It was climate change. More than 180 villages were abandoned across Syria. 70% of the farmers couldn't grow their crops because of drought, which lasted three years. They went to cities, and the cities were already stuffed full of refugees from Palestine, from Iraq, and other countries. So it was really tense, and it led to people breaking out into different groups and having different agendas, some loyal to the regime, some not. Warfare followed. Climate change was the backdrop. There have been <clears throat> um, a number of interesting texts that have been produced, most of them recent, one of them not, regarding this topic of today, war and climate change. The three on the left are relatively new, especially the one on the far left. The one on the far right, many of you have at one point in your education, you've probably read Malthus's very famous essay on what happens when food and population grow at different rates. Catastrophe happens. Do you remember him talking about starvation? Of course, that's what everyone associates with, with Malthus. Then pestilence, sickness, illness spreads when there are more people than the so-called carrying capacity of regions, nations, states allows. And the third thing he said was warfare. And that often gets forgotten. Now, this was obviously well prior to most notions of climate change, as far as I know. but. There's a legacy here. There's a history that people were appreciating that crowding, which is one of the, 
the side consequences of climate change and sea level rise is going to lead to war. And I'm sure there's others that I haven't discovered, but you get the point. Someone else who you do know, who's talked about war, and in ways that are much more in your face than the text that I just showed you, Bill McKibben. He wrote three articles on this subject, one in the Rolling Stone, one in the New Republic, and I don't remember where the third appeared, basically saying, hey gang, we're already in warfare. Let's call it World War III. That's what's going on. Now, in a way, he was talking metaphorically, but in a way, he wasn't. And as you can see from the quote, he's taking it pretty seriously. He's basically saying it's truly underway. We're losing in the north. And he's talking about the polar regions, of course, where all of the polar melting is going on, where each week we're losing something like 22,000 square miles. And then he goes on to say, if Nazis were the ones threatening destruction on such a global scale today, America and its allies would already be mobilizing for a full-scale war. And you know he's right. So McKibben is drawing our attention to something that's already going on. The only problem is in the North Pole, the polar regions of the planet, which are melting at a rate probably twice as fast as the as you get closer to the equator. So this is a very rapid process. In the far north, of course, there is not a lot of high density dwelling and habitation. If you take it to other parts of the world, say China, say the Mekong Delta, say the coast of New Jersey and New York, many other places in the world, You've got serious population density and consequences that can turn ugly. Another metaphor that has come forth in the last couple of years that speak to this kind of war connection with climate change are the so-called <coughs> carbon bombs. Have you heard of them? You probably have. Uh, actually, different authors use them to mean different things. In this case, what McKibben is talking about are those places in the world, and we keep discovering more of them, where oil and gas are located. And the map shows them. Um, these are places which many people forecast, until they are exhausted, we're going to keep exploiting them, fighting over them, by the way, or protecting them with militaries. And they are going to, as they are used and exhausted, they're going to contribute greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And in that sense, they're carbon bombs. There have been many different uh, guesstimates on what the human toll is going to be. Here you can see that very high-ranking British economist, Nicholas Stern, believes that the people who are in coastal zones and in interiors, but subject to displacement, are going to number in the billions. That's quite a statement coming from a um, senior economist who, in some cases, has been called a conservative. So exactly where are people going to go to? I'd like to spend a little bit of time fleshing this out as a preparation for the African case, which we'll uh, get to by and by. So what's your, uh, your own thought on this matter? Where are people going to go? You know, during the Great Depression, people had grandparents who still had farms. Great Depression in the United States and, and in several other countries. And so they would go back to live with their aunts and their uncles or their grandparents who still had farmland. Today, I'll bet there's maybe two of you in the room who have ancestors who are family members who still have farmland and could accommodate you, right? If you had to get out of harm's way. Am I right on that? Well, 
What are you going to do today? Where are you going to go? I want to spend some time before we answer that question talking about the immensity of the, the impact this crunch on the coast from rising sea level. To be honest with you, until I started researching it a couple of years ago with an undergraduate here at Cornell, I didn't appreciate. I mean, I just thought it was going to be, you know, a little higher tide, uh, some additional hurricanes and tropical storms from time to time. I had no idea what we're in for. And I have to tell you that the science community is divided on this. There are all kinds of estimates and ranges. It's a very contingent kind of thing. But you should know what some of the worst case scenarios are. Let's start by just um, going back to that Arctic configuration of how much ice there is to melt. If you think of the United States compared to Antarctica, you get uh, a sense of contrast, do you not? A lot of the scientific focus right now, if you look up on that upper left, the Larsen ice field is on the right side of that peninsula, and a lot of the huge ocean uh, break-off pieces of, of ice fields that have gone into the ocean and uh, are contributing to a, a very minuscule but nonetheless res relentless rise in sea level have come from that small part on Antarctica. There's a lot more waiting to break off if CO2 and other greenhouse gases continue to heat the atmosphere, not to mention Greenland and terrestrial glaciers. Here is an image of what's going to happen potentially in the next 100 years. And a lot of people are, uh, of course, using the next 100 years as a framework, uh, and I'm going to follow suit. So I want you to look at the top of these three bands and uh, just think about it for a minute, what it's telling you. If you notice <clears throat> the line um, <clears throat> where it says 210, and then below that, just a little bit to the left, it says 1880 floodplain. That's kind of a benchmark. Okay, now if we come forward to 2010, almost the present, we see that the sea level has risen slightly. And if we drop down to the middle slide, we see that in 2050, it's risen again. And similarly, 2100, all right? And in the third, the lowest of those three levels, we see that something is happening to urban areas. Uh, Maria Garcia mentioned, and I'll just restate it because it's so important, the coastal zones of the world are densely settled. They're fertile land. They tend to be relatively flat, so they're easy to build on, put your infrastructure on. And consequently, when sea level rises, it's what gets gobbled up first. It's just that simple. Now, the coast line of the world, depending on what continent you're on, um, some of it is vertical, right? So it's not going to really notice sea level change, rise. Uh, other places are incredibly flat, particularly large river deltas. The reason that Holland, without its dikes, would be underwater is it is basically a country formed from alluvial soils coming down from the Alps and the interior of Europe, right? Okay. Most of the places that are at risk today are really flat coastal areas, first and foremost. The other thing that you want to pay attention to in this graphic that's valuable is not the rising line, but the surge and storm effect, which is signified by the waves that keep getting larger and larger. The climate is getting more turbulent, so those waves aren't the same size. They're actually augmenting. And when they come on shore, well, just let me put it this way. In 2017, we had 18 named tropical storms. The average for the last 50 years has been something like 12. So you can see what's happening. Storm systems 
everywhere are intensifying. And the ocean warming has more volume, so it's rising. More stuff is melting, so it's getting into the ocean. And we have a, a situation that's extremely unpleasant. You following me? And it, with the force of tides and surge, storm surges, super storms like Sandy, et cetera, or typhoons in Asia, these storms move a lot of water inland. And when they do, a lot of that is, of course, salt water, and it's going to affect aquifers and fields, surface water. So it's not just that, oh, the water went up three inches, no big deal. It's the surge and the storm and the salinity. You combine all of that, and you have a mess that goes well inland. And that's why many people have to get up and move, because livability in these formerly fertile areas is greatly diminished. Just a, a reminder that we're not just talking about sea level rise. The asterisk there is really important. It includes the surge, the storm surge that goes along with it. And here are a couple of estimates I thought you might enjoy, maybe not enjoy, uh, appreciate seeing. Um, there's the, the scientific community usually uh, comes to the conclusion that given the intermediate level of expected rise in sea level by the end of the century, we're talking a, a displacement of something like between 67 and 187. Uh, Maria Cristina uh, Garcia mentioned last week in her lecture that perhaps 250 million people would be displaced in that time frame. And other experts have pushed that. In fact, uh, one of the limiting case estimates takes it up, as you saw with Nicholas Stern a moment ago. But here it is again, anywhere from over half a million to over a billion people. So now we're getting up into big chunks of the extent population on the planet. And you all know that a century is a heartbeat in geological time. For you guys, it'll probably be grandchildren time, right? But you care. You don't want your grandchildren having to wear hip boots for the rest of their life or moving inland. I think it goes without saying that here at Cornell, in most of the land-grant universities across the globe, the World Bank, AID, development, modernization is equated with the carbon economy. We are deeply dependent on it. We'd love to change that, but most of us are sort of, uh, be it China, be it Russia, be it the United States, be it Brazil, we're playing both ends against the middle. We're developing alternatives, but we're going to use those hydrocarbons if we can. That's the sad truth of it. And to the extent that that happens, there's going to be greenhouse gases, and our atmosphere is going to warm. <clears throat> That's going to be more intense in the polar regions, unfortunately. That's where we park our ice. That's going to happen faster there than elsewhere. And as that ice melts, oceans warm and expand and rise, there's going to be an exodus. Nothing short of an Old Testament epic event, except it's going to happen in slow motion. So it allows us some time to plan to think, to increase capacity, does it not? We are a learning species. That's the good news. And finally, um, that very movement of people, to which I now want to turn, well, almost, um, is going to bring tensions with it and conflicts. What happens if, when people move inland, the land that they are going to is uninhabitable for ecological reasons, like large brown fields, but really large scale, or inhospitable because of social laws and customs and mores or racism or religious difference. There are lots of barriers to entry that people leaving from the coastal zones are going to have to face. 
It turns out that in most parts of the world, I know of no exceptions to this, there may be some, arable land is actually going down, not because of the new arrivals, but just because of existing population growth. Land, for the most part, is a constant, or we're losing it. We can't replace it easily, right? And at the same time, global population is going to an expected, by the end of the century, someplace between 9 and 11 billion people. So, <clears throat> we have a situation where we have more people and less land. That's a problem in terms of crowding and tensions. We also have social institutions of all kinds. Here's one that you've all heard of. It's called gated cities. It means, and there's lots of different versions of this, that it's not easy to just pick up and go inland and look for grandma and grandpa these days. Many people head to cities and find that cities are, in a way, they're barricaded. Sometimes they're actually protected by private security firms or by the military in any particular country where it's going on. So it's, it's not a foregone conclusion that you're going to be welcome when you go inland. Uh, you've seen this over and over. When you get to the interior, whether that's 100 miles inland or you've gone the distance and you're 1,000 miles in the center of the continent and you think you're safe from sea level rise, guess what? Guess what? Going back, if I may, very quickly to the, uh, my comment about doing some research with an undergraduate. He, by the way, is the co-author on the piece that I asked you to read for today, Ben Kearns. Um, he's getting a PhD in earth sciences uh, at the present time, very interested in this subject and keeping it going. Um, he and I sat down one day uh, a couple years ago and asked the question, so what are the big barriers, the impediments to entry that are going to be in the way of people if we're right and we took some of the worst case scenarios and projected them forward, uh, whether it was half a million, excuse me, half a billion or over a billion people, where are they going to go? And <clears throat> we tried to identify say roughly a dozen different categories of space where people are going to seek livelihoods that are basically not going to be there or they're only going to be there with immense difficulty. Like think of, think of this. Over the last um, 200 years, there have been more than 300 certified wars, wars that are on record. That doesn't count a lot of little skirmishes. So you go inland and you settle on some frontier, and it turns out it's a war zone. And you can say, well, you know, people live in war zones all the time, which they do, but uh, it's, it's unpleasant having to walk around landmines and unexploded ordnance and having people attacking, uh, think of Syria this past weekend. It's no fun to be there. It's not a place where you would want to go. So put a big X through some hard to identify and constantly changing domain where people probably are not going to settle or if they do, it's last resort. Isn't that true? And so then we went through all of these different uh, large categories and we subtracted them out from the total amount of dry land where people could settle coming inland from the coast. And if you read the, the piece for today, you know that between a third and a half of the dry land is basically a no man's land, a no person's land. <clears throat> um, if you get there, you're probably not going to stay very long, and you don't want to get there in the first place. I'll give you an example. This is a really complicated one um, and, and very valuable to think about, it has to do with something that's been in the news quite a bit recently. We call it permafrost. Now, who in their right mind would go to the Arctic and settle on a place where frozen ground was the base? Probably very few, but it turns out that permafrost, as you can see from the, uh, the details 
in this um, slide covers an awful lot of the northern hemisphere. Where it currently is today is the light blue. And as the atmosphere melts, excuse me, warms and melts the permafrost, where we're going to be in 100 years is in that small band of dark blue. Why should we care about the loss of the thermofrost? Well, turns out that the peat and other organic material that is frozen in the permafrost is one of the best lockers for greenhouse gases. So if you melt this stuff, all of that springs into the atmosphere, and rather rapidly. It's terrifying how rapidly it is changing. And I mean, it's like if we were going to create in warmer zones, in warmer parts of the planet Earth, carbon sequestration places, plant forests to take up the CO2 and methane that's released from that, um, all of this permafrost melting, we would use up an enormous amount of the remaining land. So why not keep it there? Wouldn't it be great if we had a switch where we just turn it off and say, stop right there? Well, it, it'd be great, but it ain't going to happen. And if we want to capture that, those greenhouse gases and stop the planet from cooling, we're going to have to do a lot of exactly that, capture it, and it's going to use up space where people otherwise would have relocated. So think about it. It's, it's a triple loss. And there are other categories which contribute to this huge loss of land where people might have relocated and uh, lived happily ever after, God willing. Here's what happens when uh, permafrost starts to thaw and melt. Uh, there's many communities in Alaska that are, and in Siberia and other parts of the world where this is happening. Houses literally um, start to teeter and fall apart because their foundations are no longer stable uh, and other activities, including agriculture, not agriculture, infrastructure and pipelines and roads um, break up. You no longer can put them in these areas, even if you otherwise were willing to settle there. The totals that we found when we added up urbanization, uh, land degradation, uh, taking the coastal zone itself, the low elevation coastal zone, subtracting it out. And then on the right, uh, roadways, um, the world's dumps, which as population increases, and no trespass zones are those places that are off limits because of war or because of, they're called nuclear exclusion zones. They're downwind of a nuclear accident and they begin to really mount up over time, and more of them will surely come. Okay, so you get the point. There's a lot of land that just isn't out there waiting for us to arrive. Certainly, uh, from these nighttime satellite photos, wouldn't it, it would appear that the amount of electricity that's being generated in Europe and in Central, uh, in the, uh, the Middle East, et cetera, looks like that's where the population is clustered and concentrated, but really not in Africa, except, except where? Where are you seeing it? Along the coasts, right? The coasts, what we've been talking about. And the continent is anything but empty. <clears throat> Would you believe that the UN and other very authentic sources of population estimation are telling us that by the end of this century, we could have four billion people and perhaps more in all of Africa. That's one in three people on the planet when we get there. The planet is going to change substantially and one of the things that you want to keep in the back of your mind is that because so many people 
currently think that Africa is quote unquote empty, it's going to become a warehouse for refugees from other parts of the world. That's my prediction. But that's not the lecture today. Let's move forward. Here you can see the uh, different population estimates uh, climbing up from present to the end of the century. And in terms of the amount of coastal exposure that Africa is in line for, it has a whopping big coast. Let me just point out that if you went from Mauritania up on the far western coast of Africa and came down, made the corner, and then went a little bit south to the Congo, that's 4,000 miles. That's about three times as long as from Maine to Florida. So we're talking about an immense amount of coastline, much of which is settled. That's where the lights were. Africa's major cities, uh, for the most part, obviously not all of them, there are some countries within Africa that are landlocked, but many of its largest cities are internal, excuse me, are on the coast. And eight of the 20 fastest growing urban areas in the world are in Africa. Who would have thought that? Certainly not me. We'll go just quickly around the coast of Africa um, and drop in to various countries and give you a feel for what it's actually like on those coasts as the sea is rising. I'm gonna go back to show you where Ghana is. For those of you who are uh, not good at African geography, you can see that in the corner, right above the corner is Nigeria, and then there's Benin, Togo, and Ghana. Now Ghana, on the, uh, the slide that I showed you here has no major city on the coast. So you could say, no problem, not so. The coast of Ghana and much of the rest of Africa until recently has been full of uh, small villages which supported fishing uh, and other kinds of agriculture. In this case, <clears throat> you can see uh, a small village called Fuveme uh, it was a thriving community with two and a half thousand people really quite recently. And as you can see, the <coughs> fishing and coconut plantations are now completely underwater. And here, read the quote at the, in the second paragraph. This is a young man. That's him. The beach out in front of his house where he did his fishing used to extend out several hundred meters and it's virtually lapping up on a good day in front of his community and his house. And he wasn't kidding when he said, you wake up in the morning and you wonder if everybody who went to bed in your house wakes up in your house, or were they dragged out to sea by a huge wave. It sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? Um, let's go to Nigeria. Remember? the map that I showed you. So now go a little bit to the east by two countries, right where the corner is. Lagos, the capital, the oil boom center of Africa and actually one of the premier oil production places in the world. Turns out that Lagos, pretty much the equivalent population of New York City and growing very, very rapidly. It's Africa's largest city and then when you find out that a lot of the city is actually subject to flooding rather regularly. And from 2006 on at least twice a year, sometimes multiple more times, the water comes in. And this isn't just a wave, a rogue wave. The water actually gets four or five feet higher. So imagine living in a slum or a poor neighborhood. And as you can see down in the foreground, the rafts that people make, poor people make to get around become the sidewalks in the slums. That's what's going on here. They're attaching them together so that people can get back and forth to market. 
let's jump up to the north coast and <clears throat> look at Alexandria. The Nile Delta fans out, and as you can see in the two slides below the uh, above map of Egypt, the area is basically the breadbasket, the wheat basket of Egypt. Very, very important to food supply and survival in that country. And the prediction is whenever the water gets to be one meter, which you'll recall is a really conservative number for sea level rise over the 100 years, as many as six million people will be displaced and an, an awful lot of cropland as well. So Egypt with the, the flat Nile Delta is in no way going to escape what's coming at us. Nor is Kenya on the other side of the continent. Over on the East Coast, uh, back in 2006, there was uh, a very serious storm there and it drove large numbers of people inland. And <clears throat> uh, Kenya is still allegedly recovering from that storm. Lake Chad, I'm gonna get off the coast just for a moment to underscore the point that the interior of Africa is highly at risk as well. Have any of you ever been to Lake Chad? Or the interior of Africa, Has any of you? A few, okay. Um, this lake, formerly one of the largest lakes in Africa, uh, smack dab in the middle of Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon. Here's what's happened in the last 44 years. It's gone <clears throat> from being about 25,000 kilometers, square kilometers, to roughly 1,000 square kilometers. Imagine all of the people that made a living fishing or using irrigation from that lake in order to do subsistence agriculture in those four countries. Uh, the numbers are pretty substantial. One way to think about that is to look at the population growth, as we've done previously for all of Africa. Now let's just look at the population growth for these four countries. You can see down in the, uh, the lower right-hand corner the four country total over the six decades going from 1960, excuse me, to present. Um, it's grown five times. Very consistent with that scenario that Africa is on fire in terms of population growth. 25 million people depend on Lake Chad for food and livelihood and are becoming food and water insecure with climate change as we speak and meet here today. It's really severe. Where are those people going to go? Are they going to go to the coast? Well, in the case of Lagos, Nigeria, that is what's happening. People are, Nigeria is the interesting case where the Sahara Desert is pushing south. So it's sand from the north and it's sea from the south. Imagine that kind of a sandwiching situation. A lot of people uh, from the Lake Chad area are going to Lagos because it's not fun to live in a slum that floods, but what are your choices? You remember Darfur? We all should reach back in our memory bank and try to um, call up what that was about. Darfur is the far western region of what back in 2003 was Sudan and is now northern Sudan and southern Sudan. There was a long standing civil war that probably goes back to the 1950s in Darfur. And most people who, in, including British Home Secretary John Reid, believe that climate change, very much like Lake Chad, is what's driving the warfare. And it's interesting, the title of my lecture today was about jihad. And most of us think of jihad as Islamic jihad, a struggle to defend the highest values that you know of in your faith, but also a personal struggle for improvement and personal growth. Another way of thinking about jihad is a collective struggle, a struggle amongst society, more of a secular 
understanding of it to be sure, and I hope it's not a blasphemy to use it this way, to appropriate the language, but that is what it's going to take to overcome what's happening to the global climate. We need a jihad of a whole different kind. It, and the jihad that is commonly portrayed in the media, Islamic jihad, really is a small problem or it is exacerbated by climate change rather than being, um, like population, a sole cause of the conflict and violence that we're seeing in Africa. So this is kind of a summary slide. Um, it shows all kinds of basically um, pandemonium and uh, difficulty that's going on in the interior <clears throat> of Africa. And I want to just give credit here to an institute. It's called the Strauss Center at UT Austin in Texas. They have there a program on climate change and African political stability. And they, to their credit, have year in and year out created a data set which brings together all of the episodes of violence, especially those leading to death across all African countries and linked it to radical weather changes from extreme desertification and aridity to flooding and storms, uh, including the coast. So they are really, in addition to those authors that I pointed out at the beginning of the lecture, uh, making a substantial contribution to our understanding of the correlation between climate change disasters and pressures and human, human drama, which is traumatic. One of the things that I haven't mentioned, but I'm sure it'll be clear to you as soon as you think about the slide, the little skull and crossbones that you see off the continent are encounters with pirates. You think of that in terms of Somalia, do you not? Because that's what is generally in the news. Turns out that it is all around Africa. And one alternative to getting up, if you were a fisherman, pulling up stakes and moving inland, is to join a group of other people and being predatory on the open seas, close to shore or fairly far out. Again, it's the Strauss Center has done this, making this really interesting connection between climate change and violence. Africa, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, already identified as a go-to place, a destination for refugees. We don't think of that, do we? We see so much in the news of Africans trying to cross the Mediterranean successfully or otherwise and ending up in Europe and oftentimes being sent back to Africa. Just a week ago, there was a long treatment in The Guardian and The New York Times of Africans being sent from Israel uh, back to Africa who had entered Israel illegally. This has become commonplace. Well, at the same time, there are other populations that are trying to get into Africa because that's a better place than where they're currently living under circumstances of climate change. So, uh, let's kind of wind up here. Um, this is another map from the Strauss Center. What they've done here, this is very clever. You see Africa ballooned beyond its ordinary proportion compared to the other continents around. So what's going on here are deaths that are death tolls between 1990 and 2007 that occur in a particular country are now represented as the size of the continent or the region where they come from. So America over on the left is like a postage stamp. For all of the deaths that there are, they don't amount to very much in terms of representing them on this, this graph. Europe is similarly tiny. The Middle East, as violent as the Middle East is, it is still quite tiny compared to Africa, and then there's Asia. So are you getting what this graphic is telling us? The death rate due to violence 
in Africa is off the charts. It completely blows up Africa and makes it seem like the worst place on the planet to live. And isn't it true that if the scale of destruction, and as represented by these death mortality figures, occurred in Europe, certainly we would call it World War III, without hesitation, or the United States. Population growth stirred in with substantial climate change, which is accelerating, not slowing down, means more people on less land. Sea level rise, um, stirring in storms and storm surge that come with those, are forcing coastal dwellers inland to places that are uninhabitable and inhospitable. Where is the hospitality? I mean, think of all of the places in the world, including most of North America, which, America, which was settled by Europeans with at least a modicum of hospitality when Europeans first arrived. That is really no longer the case in much of the world. Threat modification. Some of you may be asking or thinking, is, are you saying that climate change causes war? I'm not saying that. It's far more nuanced. It's far more interesting. Lots of times it's indirect. It's exacerbating background conditions. In other words, threat multiplication. And finally, the global jihad across nations. I maintain some kind of an alliance of really enlightened and politically committed leaders is going to have to take place if we're going to check the climate jihad, which I've been describing in today's lecture, and what McKibben calls World War III. Let's, let's end it there and hear from you guys. What questions do you have? Um, so I wanted to ask if you think that there is a link between like, um, po like neo-colonialism and climate change, and could climate change be referred to as neo-colonialism because we see like past colonial powers and now the US and China contributing so much to climate change and old colonies especially like African countries are suffering disproportionately so I just wanted to ask if you thought that climate change could be considered a form of neo-colonialism. Uh, <clears throat> it's important to, that's a great question, thank you. Um, it's also kind of a courageous question because it's uh, a lot of people who study climate change don't want to politicize it. They don't want to put it into historical context that might lead us back to moments of occupation, expropriation, resource extortion. If you go back to the carbon bomb image that I showed at the very beginning of the lecture, you know and I know that those resources are not going to be left in the ground untouched. There's going to be uh, an awful lot of pressure. And whether you call it neocolonialism or uh, resource occupation, the three of the four books that I uh, showed up there are, really speak to your question. So I'm glad you raised it. So besides doing our own part to limit our own um, uh, carbon emissions and our own impact on climate change. What, what do you think the U.S. should do in terms of helping out this situation? What, what, what should our role be? Um, I guess that's the bottom line question, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> and it's not just the United States, but since you posed it that way, and we have an administration currently who is uh, hostile to not just doing something, but even framing the question as something that we need to deal with. Uh, it's important that we sober up and um, confront this. You know, the United States, um, we, we talk about it as though it was a United States, but there's a tremendous amount of diversity in opinion, uh, in institutions, in delivery systems, so the adaptation strategies 
that are out there in the world. Some of them originate in this country and in places like this university in amongst people like yourselves who go on to do graduate degrees or otherwise contribute through NGOs, etc. But let me give you a really interesting example since I focused on war and I made these claims about the military. The United States spends probably a ratio of 30 to 1 when it comes to military security versus environmental security, climate security. But James Mathis, currently the Secretary of Defense, when he was sworn in, he did not disavow climate change. And here he is, the senior military person in the United States who's actually popularized this notion of, um, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the term, uh, basically risk that comes with climate change being inflated and uh, extended with more and more, all of these background risks, all of this violence and turbulence that we're seeing around Africa is being um, made worse by the consequences of climate change. So if you believe that, there, is <clears throat> there are a whole series of adaptation strategies, the first of which has to be reducing consumption uh, and doing something about carbon emissions. Anything of the dozens of ideas that are floating, maybe hundreds, to reduce those things. Cornell students, by the way, came up with several hundred ideas for the Cornell Action Plan. Just think of that, how well-read students can be and then pitching those ideas so that universities can kind of raise the elevator and say, we can do these things. And many Cornell people end up working at the World Bank or in other institutions and having impact. The, the simple answer as to what the United States can do is basically help build physical barriers. That's called adaptation in situ, actually in the lower coastal zone. New York City is probably not going to uh, go inland. It's going to put on stilts and try to figure out a survival strategy. All of the rebuilding that's going on in the islands and the, the East Coast, it's going to be meeting new building codes. It's going to be higher. And maybe it'll be successful in outwitting the rising sea. But then there are all these internal strategies of adaptation, which basically ask the hospitality question. How can we resettle large numbers of people and avoid the hostility and the conflict <clears throat> that I've been talking about today? Um, so there's a, and then there's kind of a continuum from the coast inland. And a lot of people are, it's just, the Dutch are probably the world leaders in this because they've lived, quote unquote, underwater for so long. The richest agricultural land in the Netherlands are polders. They're land that has been recovered from the ocean. And it's, it's incredibly fertile. And they've overcome the salinity problems and now produce a lot of food for their population. They are the premier consultants around the world for how do we deal with climate change. So uh, we can look to the Dutch, among other things. Thanks for the question. One more. Just thinking about the disappointment with uh, the Paris Accord, uh, can you envision a future where you know, countries signing on doesn't matter as much? Maybe it's more symbolic. It's policy. It's important. But you have mega regions in, in different places across the world, whether you know, like a Boston, Philly, New York, I don't know, like a Paris-London connection and, uh, you know, with U.S. backing out and these cities and mayors and institutions like Cornell and others stepping up, you know, could the fight be more effective at that scale, you know, when, when these regions step up and do it themselves? Uh, where's the question mark? It's, it's... So within the context of something like the United States not signing on to the Paris Accord, and then we see that 
certain cities, mayors, institutions step up. Yep. Yep. And you know, I added this context of maybe mega, re uh, mega cities or regions like a, with a lot of GDP and influence like a Boston, Philly, New York. Around the world, could these type of mega regions, I don't know too much about the global context, could they be more effective at implementing solutions to combat climate change than maybe a traditional country? You know, <clears throat> personally, I think that is the solution. I don't think nations are going to do it. Uh, many of the administrations in countries that flank us are captured by vested interests that, you know, they'll say, oh dear, climate change, but you know what? I'm going to grab mine while I'm still on Earth, and it's going to be, uh, my kids will figure it out. I really believe that it's up to the civil society to pull off the revolution that's going to counter this thing. That's going to be the jihad that matters, and it's going to win the day if it's winnable. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Nice to see you.